12, Revelation chapter 12, we want to read together beginning in verse number 4 and reading down through verse number 6. Every week through Advent, we're looking at this chapter, Revelation 12, to take a look behind the scenes. The reality is that we live in a world that is at war, war between the kingdom of this world that is headed by the dragon, the devil, and a war between the kingdom of God whose sovereign is the Lord Jesus Christ. The reality is that we often forget that we're in this war because we only see with human sight. We only see what is physical, what's in flesh and blood. But the Apostle Paul reminded us in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12 that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities and the rulers of this present darkness. And so because of that, because there is a real spiritual war going on, a battle that we don't see with human eyes that requires spiritual sight, I thought it good for us in this Advent season to peer behind the curtain, to look behind the scenes and to consider the real nature of this war, why it exists, why is the church bombarded by the darts of the enemy, and why are, are we beset by the rage of the enemy? And as we do, one of the things that we will come to see very clearly is that while the war rages here, while the last battle is being raged here on earth, the reality is in heaven it is already over. And the announcement has been made that the kingdom of this world is is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. So I want us to take comfort as we see this morning the exaltation of the Son of God and its implications for us as his people. If you're able and willing to stand, would you please stand and honor the public reading of God's word. And in Revelation 12, in verse number 4, this is what the word of the Lord says. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Father, we pray that you give us wisdom. Uh, These are challenging verses of scripture to understand the nature of the language the genre of apocalypse these are not things that are normal for us and yet in many ways they go right to the heart of what our life is all about so i pray for wisdom help us to discern these things rightly in a way that reflects your glory in a way that demonstrates your commitment to us as your people in a way that exalts your Son, our Savior. Show us today that Jesus Christ, the Son of the woman, has been exalted to the highest place, given the name that is above every name. He has secured the right to reign. And because of that, every enemy, every authority, every power formed against him must perish. So may we be caught up in the wonder of our exalted Savior by faith and find that he cares for us. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. These are difficult things for us to understand. I think some of you have been following along day by day through the Advent devotions that we have, and uh, you've been peering into these deep things and understanding that uh, Revelation 12 is a complicated matter, and it's not your normal Advent series, and yet it does get to the heart of the real nature of life, because the reality is that we are a people who are plagued by the oppression and persecution of our enemy, the adversary, the devil. He's a real entity, a real being. Sometimes we 
we don't realize that. Sometimes we think that, oh, that's just superstition. It's just a, it's just a mythology. It's just something from the pages of the book, but it doesn't have any real bearing. But the reality is we do have an adversary. We have an accuser. There is one who is formed against us. He roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He looks at you and his me, at me as his prey and desires to destroy us. It may not seem like the devil has very much to do with your life, but if you would stop and think about all of the difficulties that you face, you'd probably see where he has had his effect upon you. You find yourself walking through a time of trouble. You don't really have anything to be worried about. Life's pretty good if you looked at everything that's going on. You've got more than you deserve. As my granny used to say, you got more than you can say grace over. But you just find yourself malcontent. Bombarded by thoughts of emptiness. Wondering why in the world you should go on living. Well, the reason you think that sometimes is because you have an adversary who desires to destroy your mind. Sometimes you have in your heart the the deep feelings of bitterness, anger, hatred toward another person. You don't know why. They've never done anything that bad to you. You you haven't really had that kind of a blow up with them. You, you've never gotten out of sorts in a real way. You just find yourself seething toward another person. You ever been there? You say, man, I just don't like that person. They grate at me. They get under my skin. Oh, their voice is like nails on a chalkboard. You know why? Because you've got an adversary who desires to attack your heart. You ever been in your place in your life where you... You just can't seem to find any peace. Oh, just everywhere you turn is turmoil and difficulty and hardship. And just seems like everywhere you go is a problem just waiting on you. You can't find any peace. It's because you have an adversary, the devil. All of these things are the reason that the Apostle Paul said, Hey, put on the helmet of salvation. Hey, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Hey, put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Have yourself bound together with the belt of truth. And you put in your hand the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith so that you can stand against the fiery darts of the devil, the one who desires to destroy you. There's a real battle going on. And in the midst of the battle, my dear friend, it's good for us to know that Jesus has already won. It's a foregone conclusion. It's a real thing. The verdict is sealed. And in Revelation 12, verses 4 through 6, we see the reason that this war is already over. Every now and then, well, once a year, actually, once a year I have a challenge before me. It's the same challenge every Baptist preacher has. It's to preach the resurrection. Every Easter comes around like clockwork, and I have the challenge of preaching the resurrection. I'm here to tell you, I can preach 51 sermons a year and not struggle that much, but Easter Sunday is always a struggle. And you say, why in the world would it be hard to preach the resurrection? It's the hinge of our faith. It's the hope of the gospel. It's the reason that we exist. Yeah, that's the reason it's so hard to preach. It's everything to us. And how do you do it in a way that isn't trite or rote, that's not jaded or hackneyed, that gets down to the bone and the marrow of where we live? And one of the things that God has been showing me in Revelation 12 is just how important the resurrection and exaltation of the Son of God is. It is the definitive hinge of history. It led to all-out war in heaven. And it caused that damnable devil to be outcast from the halls of our God. And I want you to see that in these verses this morning. I want you to see four movements in the text. And the first movement is this. I want you to see the destructive desires of the devil. The destructive desires of the devil. It says there in verse number four that the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child... He might devour it. Now you remember from last week when we talked about the explanation of the signs that the woman is a symbol, a sign 
the heavenly sign of the people of God. Uh, The people of God who were Israel before Jesus came, the people of God who are the church now, and the people of God who will be the church and Israel somehow put together for all time. And the people of God are the messianic community. That is, they give rise to the Messiah. He comes from among them. He's their Savior, their Messiah, their Deliverer, their Redeemer, their their Christ, the Anointed of God. And this Savior was long foretold in the pages of Holy Writ. You remember that all the way back in Genesis 3 that God said to that that serpent who had caused Adam and Eve to be tempted and then to fall, he said to him, one day the seed of this woman will crush your head even as you bruise his heel. You see that promise made when Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 18, he says to the people of God that one day God will raise up a prophet for you whose very words will come from God himself. You see it in the promise that God makes to David that he will have a son who reigns upon his throne and that throne will be established forever that it will come from David's line. You see it in the writings of the prophet who said, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, are not the least among all of the tribes, all the peoples of Israel, for from you will come the one who will save his people from their sins. There are these snapshots, these negatives that are going to be developed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, pointing us to his coming. And all along the way, the devil is at work desiring to prevent and to destroy this Christ who is born to save his people from their sins. And one of the things that we've talked about is that this chapter is a look behind the scenes. It's a peer behind the curtain. It's a way for us to know what is going on in the heavenly realm that corresponds to what is taking place here on earth. In heaven, the woman was in the pains of childbirth. She's about to give way to this Messiah. And the dragon, who is the symbol of the devil, Satan himself, is crouching at the birthing stool. The dragon is playing midwife, desiring to destroy this child when he's born. That's what's going on in heaven, but it begs the question, what does that correspond to here on earth? What does the devil do on earth to try to destroy our Savior? What does he do to try to prevent Jesus from effecting salvation for the world? How does the devil try to intervene in God's redemptive mission? Well, have you ever wondered why Matthew includes that story in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 18? about Herod the Great losing his mind when the wise men went home another way and ordering his soldiers to go out to that little hamlet four miles east of Jerusalem, a little town called Bethlehem, the house of bread, and slaughter the sons of women. Little boys, two years old and under... Jack. Little boys, Jack's age. Go kill them all, Herod said. You say, that's that's the most gruesome Christmas story there could be. I preached it last year on Christmas. Y'all might remember. You say, my goodness, why in the world do we have to talk about a thing like this on Christmas? We don't want to think about that. That's awful. You've got to think about that. Because you have an adversary, and he desired to destroy the Christ, the Messiah. He wanted to intervene in God's redemptive work. And so he gets into the heart of a man like Herod the Great and says, kill all those babies. Maybe it'll kill the Messiah. Why why do you think in Jesus' ministry... Every time that he's advancing the gospel... we've, We've been in Mark a long time now. And more than any other evangelist, Mark wants you to know that there's a real spiritual war going on. That's why every time that the gospel is going forward and Jesus is casting out demons, there's a fight that takes place. 
These demons are rearing their head. They're rising up. They're pushing back against the light. They're saying, you don't have any authority over me. Come on, leave me alone. Don't, don't cast me out. Don't leave me here. I, I have control over this. There, there's a war going on for control in this world. It's because the devil desired to destroy Jesus and his redemptive mission. And why do you think that varying political parties in the first century teamed up together scribes elders chief priests pharisees all religious types but then they got together with the ones who were kissing up to rome the herodians and they said we can all work together these people who hated each other who had vi viral differences they, they were they were visceral in their rejection of one another's theological positions and yet they came together why to plot against our savior because the devil desired to destroy Jesus and his redemptive mission. And why do you think that both the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John tell us that Satan entered the heart of Judas prior to his betrayal of our Lord? It's because all throughout the life of Christ here on earth, the devil is working his plan to devour, to destroy, the Savior. See, the reality is that what is happening in heaven, this dragon who crouches at the birthing stool desiring to devour this child as soon as he is born, is, it has an implication, it has a, a bearing on what is taking place here on earth. There's real turmoil in the life of Jesus. There was a real struggle going on. It's the reason that when Jesus went out to the wilderness for 40 days and he was fasting, he was giving up water and giving up food and he was preparing for temptation... But then the devil came to him and he said, Hey, if you would just accept all of the kingdoms that I can give to you and you just bow down to me, it'll all be yours. Because there's a fight going on. Satan waging a war against our Savior. That rebellious snake desiring to hinder God's work in the world. And see, so I want you to see the first movement of the text is the desire of the devil to destroy Jesus. But then I want you to see a second movement in the text. I want you to see the delivery of the Son by the Messianic community. The delivery of the Son by the Messianic community. It says in the first part of verse number 5, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. When John says that he saw this woman who was in the pains of labor, who was about to give birth to this child, and that the dragon was sitting there desiring to devour this child upon his birth, he then tells us that the one who this woman was to give birth to was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. John telling us here about the delivery of Jesus, the Messiah, from the messianic community coming out of the people of god see the reality is brothers and sisters that when you were born your mama and daddy they held you in their arms they sang lullabies over you and sometimes the lullaby was stop crying do you ever do that I mean, in the middle of the night when you've had zero sleep and you've got that baby's colicky and you just really, you just say, oh, Lord, would you please help this child to stop? I've got to have some relief. But you sang over your baby. And you wondered, like Mary did, you wondered, wonder what this baby's going to be like. Except Mary had a whole lot more confidence about what her child would be like than you do about yours and that I do about mine. See, the reality is Jesus came with a plan determined and a purpose demonstrated. From the very outset of his earthly life, his family knew exactly what he was to be about. This is the one who will take away the sins of the world. This is the one who will save his people. This is the deliverer, the promised redeemer, the Messiah. He's the anointed of God. And he comes into the world to inaugurate God's powerful rule and reign. 
When this woman gives birth to this male child, he is one, John says, who is to rule over the nations with a rod of iron. And I'm here to tell you, sometimes, sometimes we think we're the ones who are to rule over others with a rod of iron. And sometimes we act that way in our homes, men. And sometimes pastors act that way in churches. But I'm here to tell you there's only one who rules with a rod of iron, and it's Jesus Christ. When John says that this one is to rule with a rod of iron, that word for rule there is the same word that we have for the word shepherd. It's the Greek word poemen. It means to shepherd. That can be translated rule, but shepherd's a better way to translate it. He's the one who'll shepherd all the nations. And then John says it with a rod of iron. And if you say, boy, that sounds familiar, it's because it should. Because if you go back and read Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, you'll see that this was a messianic prediction. It was a prophetic word about the Messiah. All those years ago, the psalmist said God is going to do something when he brings his deliverer, his Christ, his anointed into the world. And he's one who's going to rule over the nations with a rod of iron. And the psalmist says that he will take that rod and he will bash the nations like pieces of pottery. Years ago, my daddy was telling me about the wonder of Corelware. Anybody got some Corelware in the house this morning? You got a few? Okay, some of you. That's good. Some of you got it. Your grandma's. Listen, it's still as good. 60, 70 years later, it's as good today as it ever was. And Daddy was telling me as a little boy, he said, he said, we have these dishes because they're durable. And I said, what do you mean, Daddy? He said, let me show you. And he took that plate and he just threw it in the floor. And look, don't do that. You'll scare your people half to death. They'll think you've lost your mind. But Daddy took that plate and he just slung it in the floor. And it bounced. I thought, my soul. That's pretty good stuff right there. You can't do that with crystal and china. You can do it with Corelware. And John said, Jesus is the one that the psalmist was talking about. He's the one who takes those china plates and throws them in the floor and they break. He takes all the nations that refuse to submit to his rule, that refuse to name him as God, that insist on worshiping vain idols, and he says, if you won't bow the knee, I'll make you bow the knee. And he takes that rod of iron and he bashes them like pottery. John says, this woman was giving birth to the Messiah. This male child was the one who would rule, shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron. And that word rod, it's the word that, that for a ruler, the ruler over a people, a king, a sovereign... It can mean scepter or staff. But for a shepherd, it means crook. It's the shepherd's staff. It's the crook. And what John is saying here is that Jesus, the Messiah, is the one who will shepherd all the nations. He's the one who will cause them to do what they were meant to do. And what were they created for? What were the nations meant to do? They were meant to glory in God. They were meant to worship His name. They were meant to reflect His majesty. The nations were created to rejoice in the Lord. It's the reason that in Psalm 67, in verse number 2, the psalmist says, May the nations be glad and rejoice in you, O God. The heartbeat of heaven is to cause all people to praise the name of God himself. It's the reason that God says, as you heard earlier, that he has a vision of every nation and tribe and tongue giving praise to him. And Jesus, as the good shepherd of the sheep, is the one who will, by force, if necessary, compel the nations to glorify God. It's the reason that at the end of the Revelation, John saw that when they opened the gates of heaven, because they don't ever close, the nations bring their glory into the presence of God. They turn it over. They say, God, you're the one to be worshipped. You're the one to be adored. You're the one who's worthy, not us. And when John moves through this text, he says, hey, the dragon, the devil, desires to destroy this Messiah. And this Messiah comes 
from the people of God. He's delivered through the Messianic community, and he is going to accomplish his purpose, the one who will rule, shepherd the nations with a rod, a scepter, a staff of iron. And then John gives you a third movement in the text, and it's the declaration of the Son's authority by the Father. The declaration of the son's authority by the father. Because he says there at the end of verse number 5 that her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Caught up to God and to his throne. Now here, just think about this with me. The woman who's pregnant with this child is a symbol of the people of God. And the dragon is a symbol of the devil. And the dragon is crouching beneath the birthing stool, playing midwife to this woman, desiring to destroy her child. He wants the, the Messiah, the Lord's Christ, Jesus, to be destroyed. And all right there, you think, well, this woman doesn't have the ability to protect her child. What good is she against the forces of the enemy? Will he be victorious? I'm here to tell you at some point in your life and mine, we get to a point where we wonder, will the enemy be victorious? Things are so dark, so dismal, so hurtful. The world's so devoid of hope that we wonder, is the enemy going to win? Don't you know that in the darkness that that woman had travailed through, there were times when she wondered, the people of God wondered, is the enemy going to win? And the definitive proof that the enemy doesn't win is that there is, a, there is a hand that reaches down from the courts of heaven and snatches this child up and sets it into the presence of the Father himself. He's caught up. That word for caught up, it, it, that's, a, that's a polite way to say this. The word means to snatch. Did your daddy ever tell you, I'm going to snatch a knot in your tail? My daddy used to say that all the time. I knew that meant I better straighten up. And John says, I was watching, and that old dragon was sitting there ready to destroy that child as soon as it was born. But then as soon as it came, God's hand reached down and snatched his child up and set him in the perfect peace of his heavenly presence. And you say, what in the world does that have to do with real life, preacher? What's that symbolize? Well, it's a symbol, my dear friend, of the Resurrection and the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the New Testament over and again testifies to this reality that Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. The Apostle Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 24, and he says he was raised by the glory of the Father. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4, says, hey, we've experienced a glorious transaction. We were buried with Christ by baptism unto death and raised to walk in newness of life, even as Jesus... Jesus was raised by the glory of the Father. And the writer to the Hebrews comes down to the end of his letter in Hebrews chapter 13, and he prays this glorious benediction. And he says, Now may the good shepherd of the sheep who was raised by the Father. Over and again, the witness of the New Testament is that the Father was instrumental in the resurrection of the Son of God. Jesus went to the cross. He took your record of sin and mine. Everything you've done wrong, everything I've done wrong, everything the world has done wrong. He took all of our transgressions. That means everything that we've done wrong. And he also took our iniquity. That means everything we are that's wrong. And he nailed it to the cross. And he covered it by his blood. He blotted out our debts. And on that day, as the Son of God hung upon the cross, dying in your place and mine, the dragon, the devil, must have thought, this is my finest hour. But three days later, I said three days later, hey, did you hear me? I said three days later, the Father raised the Son. 
And on that day, the enemy knew, I am a defeated foe. On that day, everybody that had wondered now knew for reality. On that day, their reality of heaven's purpose was signed, sealed, and delivered. Because on that day, the father reached down and he raised his son to life. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that because of that, because Jesus Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, God has given him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow those on the earth above the earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father you say what does the resurrection have to do with my life everything my dear friend because the father snatched the son up from death's claw and exalted him to the highest place. And by virtue of Jesus' exaltation, the devil had to go. You say, wait a minute now. I don't quite understand that. What's the devil doing in heaven to begin with? You ever wondered about that? You ever wondered when you read the book of Job or maybe you go over to Zechariah and you read there, you see some of those visions that the prophet had, you say... My goodness, what's the devil doing in heaven? I thought he was, I thought he lived in hell. I thought he was a bound entity. Well, he is now. He's been cast out of heaven now. But the reality is that prior to the resurrection and exaltation of the Son of God, the devil had access to the heavenly court. And we're going to talk more next week, but his purpose in heaven prior to Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and exaltation was to accuse. To accuse the brothers, you and me, the people of God, of being sinners. And to accuse God of not dealing with our sin. But then something happened. At the resurrection and exaltation of the Son of God, Jesus it, it declared, it's done. There's no longer an, an act of injustice. There's, there's no longer a wonder, will God deal with sin? There, there's no longer a failure on the part of God to, to, to deal with the rebellion of mankind. Any accusation that our adversary made, any attack that the devil lodged against God is now completely unfounded because Jesus died and rose in the place of sinners. And because of that, he no longer has a place in heaven. Because of that, his voice is silenced. Because of that, he is exiled for a time to earth. And one day he'll be defeated forever. See, the reality is that the resurrection and exaltation of the Son of God has everything to do with this war that we're engaged in. Because it's the reason we can say the war's already over. It's the reason we can know that victory has been won. Oh, it's the reason that we march out of here on Easter morning every year singing, Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, oh, oh, He holds the future. And life is worth the living. Why, church? Y'all say that better than that. Because he lives. Y'all got to wake up this morning. Somebody needs their coffee here. Now I want you to see one last movement in the text. Look down at verse number 6. And I want you to see the defense of the people of God by God himself. See, it says the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. The word for fled there is a, it's the same word that we read about in Matthew chapter 2 when the angel appeared to Joseph, Matthew 2 and 13, and said, Hey, I want you to get up and flee with your family. Herod's after you. you got to go. Go down to Egypt. Uh, this woman, she flees into the wilderness. Now listen, she's given birth to the Son. The Messiah's come. He's lived his perfect life. He's died a substitute death. He's been raised on the third day and exalted to the highest place. But now what's the woman to do? Because now the dragon's mad. The dragon's going to be on the warpath. We'll see that pretty soon. 
He's been silenced. He's been exiled. He, his time is done. He's the ticking. It's coming down to its very end. And he's going to set his sights upon her to try to destroy her. So what's she to do? Well, what you see is that God defends her. He protects her. It says she fled into the wilderness. I don't know about you, but I've not spent a lot of time in the wilderness. I'm more a Hampton Inn kind of man myself. Uh, some of you talk to me about your camping experiences, and that's good. I'm glad you enjoy creation on my behalf. I'm going to enjoy the air conditioning on yours. But when I think about the wilderness, I think of, some of you, you think about the beauty of creation. I think about all the problems of the fall. And I don't mean the autumn. When I think about creation and the wilderness, I think about snakes, red bugs, ticks, bears, lions and tigers, oh my. When I think about the wilderness, I think about all the things that could do harm. And it's interesting to me that for this woman, the wilderness was not, not a place of harm, but a place of help. Not, not a place of punishment, but a place of provision. When it says there that she fled into the wilderness, and she was, it was a place prepared by God in which she is to be, the word there, nourished, it, it means she's to be provided for, protected, cared for, for 1,260 days. Now, I'm just, I'm, I'll go into it later, but... The reality is that that's a symbol from Daniel chapter 7, verses 23 to 27. And it means a short, intense period of time when the people of God are under attack. And while the people of God are under attack, God is caring for his own. And while God is caring for his own, one of the things that he does is he prevents the enemies from destroying them. So instead of fleeing into the wilderness, a place that we might think is a place of brokenness, despair, running for cover, a place where enemies abound. The thing John wants us to see is actually she went into the place that God prepared for, a place where God himself is going to care for her. If you read this whole chapter, one of the things that you come to see is that these 1,260 days are both a place where she is provided for and a place where she's persecuted. And what we come to see is that's a symbol in heaven. It has a reality on earth because the reality is that in this age between the exaltation of Christ and his final coming, we, the people of God, live in a place where we are at the same time persecuted and provided for. We are at the same time besieged by the enemy and his wiry, fiery darts and also shielded and saved and kept by God himself. You see, it's, it's just it's real. In this world, we have moments when we despair, when we experience division, when we're discouraged, when we walk through doubt, when we deal with death. And while all of those things are real tools of the enemy to try to destroy us, at the same time, in the midst of them, God is caring for us. God himself, by his Spirit's presence, in the hope of the gospel, is saying that when we experience discouragement, he puts encouragement in us. The Spirit himself encourages us in our faith. God himself is the one who comes alongside of us in our doubt and gives us a reason, a hope for the faith that we have. He assures us of the truth of this gospel. Uh, when we walk through times of division, God himself is the one who reminds us that he is the repairer of the breach and the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. He gets to put things back together that we've blown apart. 
When, when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God himself is the one who says that he is our comforter, our shepherd. He's the one who leads us into his house forever. Over and again, what John is telling us is that for this short, intense period of time between the exaltation of the Son of God and the final coming of the Son of God, the people of God are living in a wilderness. We're wandering through. We're on our way home. And in this place, while we are besieged and beset by the attack of the enemy, we are also comforted and cared for by God himself. So here's really what I came today to tell you. If this Advent season you find yourself overwhelmed by the stuff of life. If the attack of the enemy seems awfully pointed, if you're here this morning, you'd say, listen, I'm not sure how I'm going to make it. My dear friend, throw yourself upon the mercy of God. Recognize that through the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ, this war is already over. And receive, by faith, the comfort and care of God's Spirit in your life. Because He really is present with you. And He has already gone in front of you to prepare a way. Father, I pray that you would help us to consider these intricate details that have much bearing for us in our practical, everyday experience. What John is talking about here as he describes the birth of this son, of this woman, the attack of the dragon and the catching up of the sun into the heavenly realm. He's describing the experience of Jesus' coming into the world and living a perfect life and dying a substitute death and then being raised and exalted to the highest place. And that exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ is the reason the accuser is silenced. It's the reason that he is outcast from your presence. And it is the reason that one day in our lives he will be defeated forever. And so while we are besieged, attacked, warring at the moment, would you remind us that you've already gone ahead of us? You've already prepared a way for us. And you are here by your Spirit sustaining us. So that rather than being overcome by the enemy, we overcome him by the word of the Lord and the witness of Jesus Christ. This Advent, may our hope be centered in Jesus, who died and rose, is risen and reigning, and yes, soon returning for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. As we stand and sing together, if you're here and you don't know Christ is your Savior, I want to encourage you to come. I'd love to share with you how to follow Christ. Sing your